Good afternoon, everybody. Hello and welcome to our monthly webinar series. Uh, and today we're delighted to welcome uh, Porak Omoran, uh, an expert in the field of mindfulness, a mindfulness teacher and also an author. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome her along and uh, looking forward to the conversation together uh, about all things mindfulness. The title of today's mind, uh, webinar series is Mindfulness, What It Is and How It Can Help. So I'll just give another little minute for people to join. I see people joining the, the, the webinar here before I introduce or allow Porik to introduce himself. Um, so just bear with me for a, a, a little second. My name is Stephen McBride and I'm the Director of Services here at AWARE, a Chartered Counseling Psychologist and, and Group Psychotherapist. So it's great to be able to offer uh, this webinar to you uh, regarding mindfulness, a, a, a very uh, practical and applicable tool for us all to, to use in our lives. So it'll be uh, great to have this conversation, as I say, with, with, with Porik in the coming hour and allow uh, Porik to uh, share his wisdom and knowledge on, on the subject. Uh, just to say before we start that if any of this material or, or conversation has an impact on you or distresses you, we, we very much recommend people to uh, reach out for support, whether it's with their GP or uh, with ourselves at AWARE on, on our support line, perhaps, you know, and I'll, I'll reiterate that message again at the end of the webinar. But uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Porik Omoran on along and uh, allow you, Porik, to, to, um, to introduce yourself. Thanks very much, Stephen. So my name is Porik Amoran, as you've heard, and I teach mindfulness and I write about it. Um, I discovered mindfulness about, it was around 1990 or towards the end of the 80s. I was a journalist at the time with the Irish Times, and um, I began to use it straight away and found it very, very helpful to me. Um, and since then, I've been teaching it, well, not since then, but for quite a long time now. I've been teaching it. I've written a number of books on mindfulness. One is called Mindfulness on the Go, and I've got one, I've got some others, and I've got one coming out in March called Acceptance. It's on acceptance. So um, I suppose uh, the easy way to get into this is to do a little mindfulness practice, and then I'll briefly explain what that tells us about mindfulness, and then I think Stephen will have some maybe questions for me, and we can do a bit of back and forth. So let's just start right now, uh, just by noticing, simply noticing the fact that you are breathing. Just noticing that. Just breathing normally, except I would like you, if you can, just to make your out breath a little bit longer than your in breath. Just make your out breath a little bit longer than your in breath. It's also helpful to breathe with your tummy rather than your chest. And when your mind drifts away, as minds do, just simply bring it back, that's all, simple. And now just bring your attention from your breathing and put it onto your body. If you're sitting down, maybe onto the feeling of the chair against your body. Just noticing that. So now you're being aware of your body instead of your breath. Noticing sensations in your hands and feet, maybe. And again, every time your mind drifts away, bring it back. Now let's turn to sounds. Starting with sounds from inside the space you're in. Just hearing them as sounds. Not judging them, not commenting on them. Just noticing them as something to be aware of.
and turning now to sounds from outside the space that you're in. Maybe notice the furthest away sound you can hear. Now back to your breathing again for a very short time. Making your out breath a little bit longer than your in breath. Breathing with your tummy. And whenever you find your mind has drifted off, just bring it back. So now let's just bring that little practice to an end. If your eyes are closed, you can open them. <clears throat> Maybe they weren't closed, they don't have to be. And what we did there was a very short and simple exercise. Mindfulness doesn't have to involve 30 or 40 minutes uh, um, of meditation. Most people don't want to do that anyway. So I like to use small, short and simple ways of doing it. What you did there was, with your breathing, you kept coming back into the moment. You kept returning every time your mind drifted away. So that's the first thing. Mindfulness is about returning to the moment. It's not staying in the moment because you can't do that. Our, our brains are just not designed that way. They drift. But what you don't want is when they drift into negative rumination, negative thoughts, you don't want to stay stuck in those. That's bad for you. And when you practice mindfulness, you get good at stepping back out of rumination, stepping into the present moment. So that's why one of the reasons why returning again and again is really helpful. Secondly, I suggested that you uh, make your out breath longer than your in breath, breathe with your tummy. There's a reason for that. Both of these things slow down your breathing. And slow breathing switches on the part of your nervous system that calms you down. So you've got two parts to your nervous system, the sympathetic, which gets you up and going, dealing with challenges and getting things done and so on. And the parasympathetic system, which calms you down. And one way to switch that on is through slow breathing. And if you practice a bit of slow breathing every day, it'll gradually bring you to a greater state of calm. So I always recommend that, just to make the breathing slow. Then we went on to your body. And again, coming into awareness of your body is a great way to come into the moment and to become calm. Some people don't like focusing on their breathing. That's fine. If you can focus on your body, and body instead, you can do that. And then we had sounds just something else to be aware of, just an alternative to being aware of your breathing or your body. It could have been the sensation of walking, you know? It could have been taste. We just chose sound there. So first, mindfulness is returning. The second thing about mindfulness is its acceptance. So we accepted that your uh, mind would drift, you know? We, we, when you were focusing on your body, you accepted your body, I hope. Um, when we focus on sounds, we accepted that we weren't listening to bells in a Tibetan temple or something. It was whatever the sounds around you were. So acceptance is the second half of mindfulness. In where you're accepting the reality of something, you're accepting that something is so. You're not surrendering to it, not giving in. You're accepting that something is so. That enables you to make new choices in your life. Um, so if you accept that you have, let us imagine, a drink problem. Uh, accepting that doesn't mean you're giving it, oh, I have a drink problem. That's it, I can do nothing about it. Once you accept, yes, I have a drink problem, then you always ask yourself, what's the next thing? And gradually you start to, to deal with it. But when you fall off the wagon, you accept that's happened too, and you gradually get back on the wagon again. Mm. So that's, the, that's, that's that. And... Um, so those are a couple of things 
by the way, when you're trying to come back into the moment, come back into the now, if something is very much on your mind, it can be a help to use um, some kind of a phrase. I often use the phrase not happening now to bring myself back, because if I'm lost in something, it's normally something that isn't happening now. It's something that happened yesterday. Mm. It's going to happen tomorrow. So I bring myself back um, by saying that phrase to myself. So that's just some things that we did there. If you like, later on, we can repeat that exercise to kind of reinforce it. So Stephen, maybe you you have some things to hear. Oh, thank you very much for that, that, um, that gentle, but very kind of... Uh, you know, helpful and, and, you know, accessible introduction, Porik, you know, in relation to what mindfulness is about and the practice of it. So uh, I know this first thoughts listening to, you know, is around the idea of, you know, really connecting with the language, bringing it back or the idea of returning. But I suppose the question I have for you is the link between, you know, mindfulness, compassion and acceptance. Because I suppose as I as I was talking to you a little bit earlier, you know, the link in that for us at Aware is, is uh, espousing a compassionate and a humanistic message for people who reach out for support, people with depression and, and bipolar disorder. So the kind of idea, I suppose, in it of the, the link between those three uh, constructs or ideas, mindfulness, you know, uh, uh, compassion and acceptance. What your thoughts on that are? Well, I think that there are um, three sort of, the three major aspects of mindfulness as we practice it here in the West now. Yeah. Um, so for instance, um, with compassion, uh, mindfulness creates a space for compassion. If you, the opposite to compassion, I think maybe is indifference, something like that. Yeah. Um, so if you don't want, just don't want to know, and um, you've got to just distract yourself with something else. With mindfulness, you are willing to be aware of what is going on for other people, say. Mm. And that calls up in most of us, it calls up a sense of compassion. Mm. We can also with mindfulness be aware of what is going on for ourselves. And that can call up a sense of self-compassion, mm. which is very helpful. So compassion, I think, is something, it's generally a wish, an awareness that somebody else maybe is suffering and a wish that they should not suffering or suffer that like, could be alleviated. Mm. So I think that's in a way what compassion is. Uh, it connects us to the world, you know, it connects us to people. Mm. Sometimes people practice mindfulness in a way that keeps them very unconnected. It's just, mm. really, but really I think uh, mindfulness is something we're all connected to each other. Mm. I mean, look at the fact that we're here talking today, looking at the many thousands and thousands of steps that went into it look at all of the people who made this happen not only in aware um but also all the people who made zoom happen and who made you know who made all of these things happen all mm. the people who created mindfulness and developed it so uh, it's 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 not an alone world we're not alone in the world and um so compassion i think especially nowadays is something that's people people want to see in the world because sometimes the world seems very harsh and threatening and self-compassion also is something people need self-compassion meaning give yourself a break uh, deciding to be a true friend to yourself whether you succeed or fail mm -hmm. whichever i was reading something by in a buddhist uh, uh, magazine this morning some a therapist was saying that that perfectionism is really it's the, it's the curse and the illness of our age, he thinks. Mm. Um, you need to be able to be a friend to yourself. Whether you succeed or fail, <clears throat> whether you think you've done well or badly. And the thought that crosses my mind sometimes is that we're in a world characterized by, by war and conflict, climate change, yeah. uh, all sorts of things. And yet we mm. give up to ourselves for not being perfect. I mean, really. <laughs> How can you expect to be perfect in this world? So give yourself a break and, and try to have a friendly attitude towards yourself. So I think it's an important part of the compassion as well. Yeah. yeah and that leads to something of an, of an acceptance too. Yeah, they're very wise words, Mark. Yeah, thanks for sharing them. I suppose just to expand it out a, a little bit, what, what would you see, I suppose, yeah, you know, um, as, as some of the benefits of 
incorporating some uh, um, mindfulness practice or becoming more mindful on a, on a daily basis and how it can be helpful. And also, I suppose, to, uh, uh, to contextualize it or to bring it into view, the idea that it doesn't, and I really uh, connected with what you said, it doesn't have to be, nor do people maybe have the time to practice 30 or 40 minutes, perhaps, of mindfulness a yeah. day. So how to keep it simple, I suppose, is what I'm getting at. And, and what the, the, the hoped for benefits of it are? Well, I think what, the, the benefits I find are that when I, it enables me to be aware of things, maybe challenges, maybe problems, you know, maybe things that are, that are not going right. I've got plenty of them in my life too, but without getting dragged into it, in the sense mm -hmm. of without getting <clears throat> torn apart by it, I can, mm -hmm. like I said, this is happening, or this might happen, or that might happen and be aware of it, uh, accept that that is so, and then say, well, what do I need to do next? Maybe there's something I can do, maybe there isn't. Uh, <clears throat> or even at, at night, if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm lying awake in bed, and my mind wants to start going over, oh, you know, what about this thing and that thing? I can just go to mindful breathing. I'm not denying it, but usually mulling over these things at night and staying awake isn't that helpful. Um, so it enables me also, if I have a lot on, at, if I am mindful, I'm not going into, how am I going to get this done? Oh, my God. Uh, just being mindful, I get through it all much more easily mm. and more effectively, I think. Mm. Mm. Now, what that involves is coming into mindfulness in very simple ways. Maybe just being mindful, say, of the breath in my nose. That's one way I would do it. Or mindful of the breath in my tummy. Um, are mindful of sounds just even for a few for a couple of minutes sometimes mm -hmm. even less than a couple of minutes sometimes just as a pause of a few seconds and the thing I would say <clears throat> about <clears throat> 30 or 40 minutes of meditation like if you do a practice for a, for a long period of time I, I, you would call it a meditation I guess uh, yes uh, some people, if they meditate for long periods of time, it awakens mm -hmm. memories and sensations that their mind has pushed away, maybe for good reasons, but for whatever reasons, it's pushed them away, and they can find it disturbing. So for that reason, I always... And so if you've got someone to talk to about that, that's fine. They're part of a mindfulness group, but everybody doesn't. Um, so I always suggest a shorter mindfulness practices, maybe up to 10 minutes at most, um, and I think that also it's more practical. When you're trying to do 20 or 30 or 40 minutes of, of a mindfulness practice, I often think it's a bit like waiting for a bus mm. to come for, 20, for 30 minutes with nobody to talk to and without a phone to look at. It gets a bit boring, you know. Now, it's kind of, in a way, meant to. It's great practice in coming back into the moment. But really, if you have those short practices that bring you back and back, they can do the same over time. They can be equally helpful to you. Uh, so it might be, it might be um, just doing something like, you know, there's a, <clears throat> where you, 7-Eleven breathing, where you count to seven while you're breathing in and to 11 while you're breathing out. Even just doing that a few, for a few minutes can be helpful. Uh, but I think some, yeah. that, that benefit of not getting caught into the rumination, of having a greater sense of acceptance, um, so a greater sense of calm really results from it. Yeah. yeah. Linking it a little bit to the, um, the, the people who access AWARE and link in with AWARE for support and information and education, people with depression. One of the aspects of depression that, that strikes me, and it struck me when you talked about it, uh, negative rumination yeah see the idea of these repetitive thoughts in an ongoing way and you just referenced it in relation to what can happen or what can stalk people in the middle of the night when their yeah. sleep is disrupted mm -hmm. or as you're trying to drift off to sleep at the yeah. natural time you go could you expand a little bit on the um the the, the idea around negative rumination and um firstly I suppose what you mean by it and and maybe some of the antidote to it uh, with, with a view to mindfulness, yes. Well, uh, when you're going over and over something, 
It mm. could have happened 20 years ago, or it could have happened yesterday, <clears throat> or it could mm. be something they're afraid is going to happen. Going over to in that very negative kind of way. So it's kind of a painful experience to go over it. Um, <clears throat> Professor Mark Williams, who, who uh, has done a lot of the work on mindfulness and depression at Oxford University, said that it's almost as though you're trying to solve a problem that you can't really solve by just thinking over and over it. And that it, you need to step back and into the moment and into accepting that it's there and then into what you need to do next. What you need to do next might not be about the problem. It might be something else. Maybe something <clears throat> said something hurtful to me 10 years ago that really annoyed me. And here I am today thinking about it and getting into it. Maybe what I need to do next is to just go out for a walk. Maybe I just need to go and uh, um, have a coffee somewhere. You know, maybe I just need to get on with my work. Um, I don't have to be a prisoner of that. And people often don't realize that. Mm. You don't have to be thinking <clears throat> the thoughts that you're thinking right now. You can think something else and engage with something else. So he would say that here's the thing that happens. First of all, he finds that in his research that mindful when people have been have chronic depression, i.e., they've been depressed, seriously depressed three times or more, that if they practice mindfulness, that can cut the rate, the rate of relapse very significantly. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and so he would say that what, what can happen ordinarily is that you Let's say you find yourself suddenly ruminating about, you find yourself suddenly in a very low mood. This comes down and it can crash down on you. You can waken up with it, whatever. You then go into ruminating. What's wrong with me? Nothing is working. Uh, I'm weak, etc. Mm. All these thoughts. Um, and that rumination then pushes you down into a deeper depression. Mm. This theory. So it can take a mild depression or a mild dose of the blues and push it down into a deep depression. Mm. And with mindfulness, what you learn to do is to accept the mood. Okay, I'm in this low mood. It's a lousy mood. Don't want to be in it. You accept that it's there. You allow it to pass in its own time. Now, that's easier said than done, but you mm. allow it to pass in its own time while you go on with paying attention to things in the moment and gradually it passes, whereas with ruminating on it, it can get deeper and just push More it down. problematic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, that is his sort of theory about it, that rumination is really a big, a big issue, a big problem, and it's something that, that, that we all do it, but with mindfulness, you catch yourself doing it. If you practice mindfulness, you'll notice, oh, I, I was gone there for a minute and then you bring yourself yeah. back. And, and it's the kindness, it, yeah, and it's the kindness and compassionate aspect of it, of bringing yourself back because the brain will drift. So in other words, that's the antidote, it seems to me, listening to you, Porik, for the idea that, oh, this isn't working for me or this can't work. It's the acceptance that your mind or our minds will drift and it's bringing it back into the present moment, non-judgmentally, I suppose. It's bringing it back in non-judgmentally, and um, it's kind of, I mean, Freud had this idea of the superego, which is a part of your mind, I suppose, that's all the time judging you, you know? I you did this wrong, you did that wrong, you had the wrong career and you didn't do that, and look at the colour socks you're wearing today, and um, look at what you had for your lunch, and you ate that bar of chocolate yesterday, it's on your case all the time. And so it's, we're kind of almost, he would say designed to criticize ourselves and to attack ourselves with mindfulness you might notice and with self-compassion you know yeah that that is so but i'm still a friend to myself and i'm not going to go up go and beat myself up because i've got you my super ego to do that for me so i'm not going to beat myself up i'm going to go on with my with my day as a friend to myself um and accepting that i am a person with with the same kind of faults as anybody else. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it sounds as though when you describe Freud's idea of superego, it links into a comment you made a little bit earlier around perfectionism, the drive to get everything right in an ongoing way all the time. And that's uh, not realistic because of 
the nature of us, I suppose, as, as, as human beings being uh, fragile and vulnerable because of, as you just mentioned as well earlier, I think the life events that we're experiencing, war, climate change, yeah, sure, yeah. across the living crisis, as well as our own human vulnerability and fra frailties. Yeah, perfectionism, there's all sorts of theories as to why it came about, and I won't go into, into them, but uh, it just struck me that the other day that uh, when, you're, when you're in sort of, say, school and primary school, I think 40% is a pass. It was when I was in school, maybe I presume it still is. 40% is a pass, okay? Mm -hmm. So somewhere along the line in life, we started to kid ourselves into thinking we should be able to get 90% or it's no good. You, know, you should always get a first. Um, but I thought, well, you know what? Suppose we say, well, in life, it's okay if, if you get 40%. You know, give yourself that pass. That's all right. Because again, in this random world with all sorts of things happening over which we have no control, how in the name of God can you get 90%, you know? So <clears throat> go for a 40% mark. And um, sometimes you might not even get that, but that's okay. Um, so it's it's the perfectionism is, is uh, it's that fear of not being good enough. Um, uh, is it Abraham Lowe, the name of the person who founded Recovery? incorporated in Chicago back in the 30s and he had this saying that this uh, say, saying that um, you want to be perfect but you fear you are not even average mm -hmm. that's a good saying because you can feel that I can feel that in my gut almost yeah that sounds mm -hmm. right to me you know mm -hmm. and even to say it's okay to be average you know mm -hmm. fine and by the way when you're saying it's okay mm -hmm. to be average I do not mean an average of the most brilliant people in the room. I mean, average, you know, as a human being. It's like, a, you know, a, a person who is shy, who has social anxiety, will often judge themselves against the most extroverted person in the room, the life and soul of the heart. Sure. And not against the average person in the room, who in fact is far quieter, you know. Um, Comparing ourselves unfavorably against something that's uh, not necessarily attainable, because how would it be attainable? Exactly, because, it's not yeah. fairly attainable. And as any of us who, who work in the counselling psychotherapy field know, that person who is perfect or who is the life and soul of the party very often is a very, very insecure person who is for whom this is a cover-up, you know, and quite, mm -hmm. quite fearful of, of, of not being able to keep up the act. Actually, mm -hmm. they don't need to keep up the act, you know, but... Be yeah. good. Just sort of, um, and, and listening in, in tea and coming across some of your uh, mat material myself, Porrick, in preparation for this webinar and also personally reading uh, uh, some of, of your stuff, you know, and, and resonating a lot with it. I suppose I wanted to tune into the idea that, uh, and it was some of your more recent uh, uh, musings on the idea of being mindful around the use of uh, mobile phones or technology. Yeah. And how and, and I know we're going to have a chance for people in the audience to ask some questions through the chat function. Yeah. And please, if you do yeah. have any comments and perhaps practice a little bit more of a mindfulness exercise before we finish. But just to kind of from a, a theoretical or from an ideas point of view, uh, if you could expand on that, that would be great. I just think that the people get very um, critical of technology and of our, our, our involvement with it. But it's here. And it's, it's, it's an extension almost of ourselves. And what I would suggest is being just being mindful of it while we are using it. So if I'm, if you're waking up if first thing in the morning, you check your phone when you're waking up, mm. take a breath first and then check it in awareness that this is what you are doing. And then you're less likely to get sucked into it. Um, if you're watching somebody's perfect life on Instagram, let's say, if you just do that mindfully with awareness that behind the camera, this person's life may not be perfect, they may just be like you or me, you know? Um, uh, though they have to, they're getting paid to put up this uh, this, this, this great image. Mm. Um, or if you're watching stuff on something like uh, like TikTok, which where it comes up so, so fast, it's easy enough to get dragged, pulled into almost a kind of a trance, if you like. And, um, just to step back and just be mindful of what you're watching. Um, people talk about there's a phenomenon now in regard to climate anxiety called doom scrolling, where you go mm -hmm. through 
videos, especially on TikTok, of doom and doom and doom and doom, um, which can just leave you almost not able to do anything, uh, feeling very, very powerless. Uh, whereas once you're aware of that, you can maybe go and look for stuff also that gives you a more hopeful view of things that are people are doing, a more hopeful view uh, so that you can lift your head out of that despair. Um, if you do do that sort of thing on TikTok, there's a person called the Garbage Queen who is very good for giving both sides of the story. Good. <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, it's just bringing that that little sense of um, sense of of, of awareness. Um, Victor Frankl, the existentialist philosopher who wrote *Man's Search for Meaning*, talked about um, mm. the between, between action and reaction, there is a space, and in that space is our opportunity to make a choice. So you don't have to sort of react um, straight away. And I think it's important, that mindfulness thing is important because we are surrounded all the times by algorithms and things that are trying to sell stuff to us based on based on what we what it knows we already like. Uh, sometimes that's useful if you're looking for something and it knows what you want. But all these algorithms that are you know behind social media posts and that you need to be aware that. That that's going on and they just have that little space in which to make a choice mm. that space in which to make a choice yeah, yeah. that's well put yeah that we have a choice and try and empower ourselves to know yeah. and be aware that we have a choice that that yeah. we have an influence and our own authority i suppose in some regard to do that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 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 we have we have our own authority our own um our own bit of autonomy yes and, um you know it's not and and everything that you see on screen, of course, is not true. Uh, so it's um, I suppose as a journalist, I have to confess, even back in the days when it was only you only had print and radio and uh, old style television, it was still you were still sort of putting up stories and headlines saying, "Oh, this is really important. This is sensational," you know. And um, so what we have with with the technology mm -hmm. now is that, like on steroids, <laughs> I would say. Um, yes, sure. Yeah, sure. Well, it's, it, it certainly is a, yeah, a, a more fast paced society, which is where mindfulness comes in, you know, perhaps, you yeah. know, in relation to providing the antidote and the space to become more aware of our surroundings and returning to it, as you say, bringing it back, you know, yeah. the language that I'm tuning into that you've used uh, earlier on in, 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 yeah. the, in this webinar. I just yeah. wanted to return to a few points, Boric, uh, that, that you made earlier on in relation to, and, and my sense is they, they emanate perhaps from um, Buddhist philosophy, the idea of the circle of reaction and also the two arrows. If you could expand on those ideas uh, for the audience that's here this afternoon, because they seemed to, to, to make great sense. And, and uh, I think they'll be of benefit to people uh, listening on and present with us today. Yes, um, I, I will do. I'd like to do that. The, the circle of reaction is about uh, <clears throat> it's this Buddhist ideas in Buddhist psychology that we that we as we go through as we're growing up and growing through life through life we have we have reactions and habits of mind and reactions to all sorts of things. And as you're as you're going through life, it, it can almost become a bundle of reactions. You know, so mm -hmm. something happens. Uh, somebody whom you didn't like. Uh, when you were growing up, let's say somebody who was at school with you and you just didn't like them. And now years later, you see them walking along the street and you fall into all the old reactions. That's also what are they doing out here? And they did this and they did that. And you could spend the whole evening just thinking about them and annoying yourself and everybody else about them. Mm. With mindfulness, you become, just become aware. Oh, I'm reacting that way. And you step out and into making a choice. You might go and talk to them. You might not. You might go and do something else. Um, so you, you, you're you're stepping out of if you think of a of a step, something happens. You react. Your reaction mm -hmm. can carry you away, and then that can determine what you're doing next, which can be having maybe uh, uh, a rotten evening or getting vexed or you know, um, mm -hmm. or but mind was introduced another step. You see this person, you react, but now you realize you're reacting. 
and you, mm. <clears throat> you pull yourself out of it into the present moment. That really is a way. To do. Are you using that phrase "not happening now"? Mm-hmm. Using that phrase, um, and then you can you can get more make a more different choices in your day. Um, so that's the that circle of reaction. The Buddhists would say that often when we go into reactions, they would regard it as going into a trance, and that trance carries you away. Rumination is like that. In, in a way, this is. Yes. it's like a trance um, mm-hmm. stepping your ears oh I'm doing that and then you step back out of it um, sometimes by the way the now that you come back into might be quite boring but it's still a better place to be mm-hmm. than some of the places we can go in our head mm-hmm. you know? um, even, if, even if it's boring and, and um, uh, it's still but just step out into it um, and the two arrows story is Similar, this is an old Buddhist metaphor. It kind of is a way of thinking about what I've just said. A very old metaphor, which is supposed to have been told by the Buddhist, but I don't know whether it was or not. But the idea is that if you were going about your lawful business, your ordinary day, and you were struck by an arrow, mm-hmm. uh, that would be a very painful thing. Mm-hmm. Very bad for you. You wouldn't like it. Doesn't matter how much meditation or anything else you do, you wouldn't like this. Mm-hmm. Let's imagine that the the wound heals gradually. Mm. So the wound has now healed. It's all passed. But you're still going over and over and over and over this thing. And it's a disgrace. And people days, days. And how does... That's like taking a second arrow and sticking it into yourself. It's yes. Going. So the first arrow is the pain, the painful events of life that we have not been able to dodge and the painful events of life that we will not be able to dodge. Mm. The second arrow is the way that we add on to that by ruminating on it, by never letting it die down. Um, Now, if something happens that's upsetting or hurtful and you're mindful and you're just, you're accepting it, you're dealing with whatever you have to deal with in a practical level, you're not ruminating, you will still be a little bit more stressed for a while because it's happened. But with the, it's with ruminating over to keep it going, I think. Um, and it makes it worse than it needs to be. Mm. Or say a delivery is made, something you were hoping to get today that you ordered, and it yes. doesn't arrive. You know, okay, so that's, it's painful in, in some fairly small way, but you can, so let's say that's the arrow. Yes. You're going on and on about that for the whole evening, um, and going on, going, on, uh, going on Twitter or something to complain about it, etc. That's the second arrow that you're just adding into it. Yes, so you that's drop a very good. Yes. If you can drop the second arrow if you can. Sometimes that applies to more profound losses and things that we have. Uh, and sometimes it takes a long time to be able to do that. If you're grieving for somebody, mm-hmm. I would have you about the two arrows. But a time will come, a time will come sometime in the future. You know, with, with grief, it's sometimes like if people talk about it, it's like a the, the loss can be looking like, like you'll get a picture that stretches from the floor to the ceiling. It's yes. overwhelming. But the further away you go in time, when you look back, the picture seems to be getting smaller. It's not really getting smaller, but it's just perspective. But a point comes when you can pay more attention to your now, your life in the now. And that's where the idea of the arrows comes in, that you can, you can drop that second arrow. You honor and, you honor and acknowledge the loss. But you don't have to keep it going. You don't that have culture. To keep it going. And thanks for sharing that, those ideas, you know, which have a real, you know, tangible meaning for, for us all in our lives, because there's not there's not anything uh, or should I say there's nothing we can do about the first arrow because painful and difficult experience will happen to us all in life because it's the very nature of being human, yeah. you know, uh, and, and it's how we react and not compounding the loss or the stress yeah. or the sense of overwhelm at times yeah. by uh, uh the, the second arrow yeah very well put yeah yeah it's a it's a, it's a world that, that in which we need these kinds of things to protect us so remember these all the, what i'm talking about is approaches and techniques that were devised two and a half thousand years ago in the buddhist tradition some people think it came it was devised even earlier than that in the hindu tradition so people have been feeling this way for a long time it's yes. Not now, you know, 
yes. um, and it's well tested over a long period of time. Great, great. Yeah. There's a couple of comments that are after coming in, Borik, from our audience this afternoon, yeah. just to share with you, you know, and, and uh, a, a person in the audience wants to know if you could say a little bit more about being a friend to yourself and what that might look like. Well, being a friend to myself might be accepting accepting uh, that, let's say, you could look at the fact that there are things that you didn't do that you wanted to do. Mm. Instead of complaining endlessly to yourself about it, you accept that this is so. Maybe you accept the painfulness of that, and then you go on. But you don't keep coming back to it. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. Uh, that's one thing. Um, accepting maybe that, you know, people often are very uncompassionate towards their own bodies, for instance. Mm. Uh, because bodies are not perfect. Um, and it, just accepting <clears throat> that your body isn't going to be perfect. And that's it. You know, that, that and the bodies that look perfect often are not. They're just, they're just made to look that way made up to look that way um accepting that accepting that you ex if you accept that you are an angry person mm. and you can be compassionate and say okay i'm being compassionate to myself about this saying that this anger is bringing is causing uh, troubles for me for other people and also for me when you accept that you kind of begin to change you know you know, acceptance often, strangely often needs to change. Um, if you're, if you, um, mm. you know, wh when you're, or if you're looking to the future, even saying, well, maybe there's, if you're saying, I must do this and I must do that, um, watch out because you're being uncompassionate. All the things that you must do, you're not going to get to do. Um, mm or I should have done this, I should have done that. It's crazy because you do not know how that would have worked out. You do not know. You know, you yeah. just don't know. Yeah. And so it's dropping the, the, the shoulds and the, uh, watching out for the shoulds and the musts. Don't let them, don't let Take them. Take over. Yeah. yeah, right. There's, there's another comment uh, for, uh, around procrastination, you know, and a person saying that in the evening time, that they say to themselves, I'll get up in the morning and engage in a list of tasks, maybe links back to the musts or should, but the yeah. morning comes and then the avoidance or the procrastination happens and um, rubbish distracts them, you know, or not engaging in yeah. what they want to engage in. So what's your sense of that or any kind of useful um, kind of hint around it? Maybe? I don't know. I mean, procrastination, if I knew the answer to procrastination, I would be so rich, I could buy Twitter back from Elon Musk, you know. Um, <laughs> but I, I... What I do, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a chronic, I, I think, procrastinator. And um, what I tend to do is, I know, now this sounds, this would get me pick, get you kicked out of productivity school, but I do have my, my to-do list. Um, I often will, will pick 10 things at random, um, and I'll spend five minutes on each. I just do this little drill. You would be amazed how much you get done that way, by the way. Because um, sometimes you will then go on and do more um, or it just gets the ball rolling. Yeah. Pick things at random. So some people call, call it what the salami approach or something, um, salami technique. Um, so I would do that. Or I would work. I also tend to work on things for 25 minutes, take a break for five, do another 25. Again, taking that break means you don't get tired out by doing it. So one thing is, with the procrastination is that like procrastination in many sometimes it's like caution I yeah. that caution is good you know yeah sure there's a few good a few things in my life now if i procrastinated on and not done them i'd be ha happier than, than having done them and, Area. Uh, yeah yeah um so i think just it it's procrastination and what's the other thing oh yeah imposter syndrome they're they're two of the big things that people have and I think that procrastination is something that I think is fear. It's basically, I think, probably fear and anxiety. And sure. that's why if you can do, just do the smallest next step you can think of. Yeah. You know, the smallest next step. 
Um, smallest, or sometimes it's framed as the next right thing, however small that might seem. The yeah. next right thing. I might just be looking up a website and saving the address of it. Just that. <laughs> Um, but you might see something on it and say, okay, well, maybe I'll just click on that and see. Um, I might be asking for somebody somebody for help, but then taking the next smallest next step next time. Um, so I think it's doing the next thing, breaking it down, um, realizing that, and as we all know, the things we procrastinate on, when we finally do them, we often do feel a sense of relief and we're wondering why this wasn't even hard. I think that's one reason why I pick things at random I think procrastination is something has some unconscious sources. I really don't think it's got it's a conscious logical thing. Yeah, yeah, I get you. Okay. Yeah, sure, sure. And sometimes things I have to do. If I had to re re renew, say, an insurance policy on mm. the, the car, I would procrastinate on that until the day before. Um, but there's no reason to do it. You know, no reason to do that procrastinating at all. So there's something sub unconscious in there. So that's yeah. why I tend on my to-do list often to pick things at random and to work on them just for a few minutes. Um, because then I'm not, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of sabotaging the unconscious by doing that. You sure. Know? Sure. Yeah. If I try to rank it in order of priority, my unconscious might sort of say, Yeah, well, you just don't do that today, just, just leave that for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Randomizing. Very good. So yeah. Just, <laughs> thanks, Pori. And does, does someone here uh, talking, a member of the audience talking about having undertaken guided meditation via SoundCloud and YouTube for 10 minutes or so at a time and seeking some uh, advice or hints uh, around moving away from this guided mindfulness meditation and to meditate without the guidance once you get more uh, assured? I suppose, is that the subjective experience of everyone's own opinion or maybe a bit of both? Or what's your sense of that? Yeah, it varies or, around. I tend to tend to do my meditation without listening to, to some. I do have guided meditations, guided mindfulness practice on SoundCloud and on my website and so on. But um, <clears throat> some people like listening. Some people like the, 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 that guidance. Otherwise, just... Try to just bear note what are the, the main steps of what you've been listening to and do them yourself. Um, or you'll always create your own meditation, you know, um, like we'd be doing, we'd finish off maybe with a, a, a short body scan, which is a, being aware of your body from your toes to the top of your head in stages. That's something you don't really need to have to be guided on. Um, you could go to a place in your mind that you, you associate with calm and relaxation and, and imagine you're there and imagine you're just breathing slowly and being there breathing slowly for a while. Well, that's a place that's in your mind that you know about, so you don't, nobody can guide you in that really, I suppose. Um, but yes, I think you can do all of these practices without necessarily being guided. Though I know that it depends. It is horses for courses and for some people, it's good that they like doing listening to, to those. Uh, some people like um, like uh, doing it themselves. Some people like maybe using a, a video on YouTube or something. Uh, so it all, it, it's really what works for you, you know? It's what works for you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul. There was someone looking for you to, uh, uh, to remind uh, us all, I suppose, of the phrase for coming back into the moment, the phrase well, that you use. Not happening now is the phrase I use, yeah. Not happening now. Um, people use all. I mean, you know, traditionally there's that phrase: "This, this will, this too will pass." Yeah. Lots of people use. Um, yeah. And uh, I think it was originally devised some thousands of years ago. Legend has it for a Persian emperor to to remind him that all of his glory and his splendor would one day be no more. But since then, people have changed it so that they're using it just to remind us of this too will pass, you know, Yeah, uh, and it will. Um, and it's curious, if you made a list of all the worries you've had since you were born, they would probably fill many volumes. You probably can't even remember most of them, you know? Sure, indeed. And in relation to the, someone with a more practical question, you know, and, and you've mentioned your website, and I dare say uh, people can get further information about classes that you have, whether they're online or in person yeah. in, in, in Dublin or... Uh, or, or whatever and, and is your website uh if you wanted to uh, uh call that yeah. out now it's 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 podrigamoron.com 
Um, so if you get if you get my name more or less right, I think it'll you'll find it on Google. So podigamoran.com, I think it's in some links somewhere anyway, or if you look at this video and if you're if you're watching this video on YouTube. Um, and it's also the uh, mindfulnessexperience.com would take you to the same place. Yeah. Um, so but generally speaking, if you just Google me, you'll find you'll you'll, you'll find me. And right. it has mindfulness practices, audios, it's it's all it's almost everything is free. Um it's got um and I've got links to my courses. All of my courses now are um are on a donation basis. I suggest two prices that are, people can pick their own. Um, I started out at the start of the pandemic and I've just kept it going because it, it works for me and it works for other people. Right. Uh, so it's affordable to all, you know? Um, and uh, so that I would suggest, it, it, just another thing to just, just check out on the courses page. Um, but th there's, um, and then there's also, there's also, you also find a link to, to a, a YouTube channel that I have also. I have a Facebook page and all that, but generally it's fine, fine easier to put in my name. And Great. Thanks for that. Thank you. And without further ado, before we go into the body scan, I'd just like to thank you for your, your considered wisdom and knowledge on, you know, on life as it expanded out from mindfulness and the link between how we live our lives and uh, the importance of, of, of being mindful and practicing it and making it accessible in, you know, in, in the way that you spoke about it and the clear and, um, you know, available language that you used around it, you know, for us all to think about it. And I'm really kind of connected and resonating with the idea of, you know, the idea of um, acceptance and compassion and the idea of trying to accept ourselves as, as humans and, and warts and all, I suppose, you know, and, and letting down that second arrow, the idea of what happens when there's uh, ongoing negative, hostile commentary or rumination which uh, uh, can be devil, be devil us all at times, you know. So, um, yeah, thank you. And to pass it back to you, Porik, if you have a, a concluding remark, and then to bring us through the body scan as we head towards the, the end of, of the webinar this afternoon. So thank you very much, Stephen, and thanks for inviting me to this. It was very enjoyable. And um, remember that mindfulness is an attitude as well as um, a practice. So if you are a person who is never for the whole rest of your life going to do a mindfulness practice, like mindfulness of breathing, just remember the mindfulness attitude of just return, come back into the now more often than you've been used to doing, accepting more, being more compassionate to yourself. And if you practice that attitude, uh, th that will mean that will make a big, big difference to you in your life. So let's do this, this, this practice called the body scan which you'll have probably come across before in different contexts, but it's becoming aware of your body from your toes to the top of your head in stages. Lots of people use this when they're lying awake at night and they do this instead of worrying. And it gets often they're asleep by the time they get to the end, uh, which is often the desirable thing. You can also use it just sitting down during the day. You could even use it standing up to ideally not falling asleep during it. Um, there's all sorts of ways you can use it. So let's just do this. So starting by bringing your attention all the way down to your toes, bringing your awareness all the way down to your toes right now, just noticing them, maybe notice any sensation in them. Not judging them, not thinking about them, you're just noticing. And moving on to the soles of your feet, any sensations there? And moving on to the tops of your feet and your ankles. As we're doing this, whenever you find your mind has drifted, just bring it back to wherever we're at. Now your calves. So all you're doing is bringing your awareness to your calves in this case, nothing else. Now your knees.
when doing this yourself, you can pace yourself by the number of breaths you take between each part. One breath, two breaths, three, whatever. Now your thighs. And your hips. And in being aware of the various parts of your body, do so with self-compassion and without criticism. Now your lower back. And your upper back. Noticing how your upper and lower back widen and narrow a little as you breathe in and out. And allowing your back to be relaxed as you're doing this. Now your chest. And the area around your heart. Now your tummy. You feel many of your emotions in your tummy and your heart. Noticing how your chest and tummy expand and settle back as you're breathing. Now your arms. And your wrists. Back of your hands. Your fingers. And the palms of your hands. and your shoulders. And if they're tensed up, just let them relax because they carry a lot of tension. Back of your neck and back of your head. Top of your head. Now your forehead. Imagining perhaps any stress being smoothed out of your forehead. And your face, mouth and jaw, and your throat. And now just for a moment, just notice yourself, notice your whole body breathing. Just imagining that every breath you take is filling every cell of your body and noticing your body breathing. And now gradually just bringing your awareness back into the space that you're in. And we will finish that particular body scan. So I wish you all well with your mindfulness practice. And thanks very much for being here. Thanks very much for your presence and for, for both the practical and uh, the ideas behind it and the theory behind it. So it's been great to, to have you along with us. 
And just to uh, share with you all in, in, in the audience that our, our next webinar will be taking place on the uh, second Wednesday in December, which is the uh, Wednesday, the 14th of December. And the title of it is Managing Our Mental Health While Being a Long Way From Home, and 12 noon, the second Wednesday in December. And you can sign up to our webinar newsletter on aware.ie forward slash webinars to get notified about our monthly webinar series. And also, if you've been impacted by anything that we've discussed today or are seeking further support, please reach out to us you know, on our website, aware.ie, to get further information. And as you've registered for this uh, webinar, you'll also receive a uh, communication after the webinar about uh, a survey as we evaluate and get a sense of what people's thoughts and feelings have been about our webinars. So we encourage you to take part in that too. And without further ado, just to wish you all well uh, in the audience uh, as the afternoon and the day goes on. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.